Well, it's getting kind of later in the conference. Um, we've, one of the themes of this conference is intersections and intersectionality. But by now, there's probably all sorts of things intersecting in your minds. And you have to figure out, how do I make sense of all this? Uh, so maybe I'll leave you more confused, but hopefully it'll at least be interesting. Uh, so we're all here because we're interested in how to help people who have psychotic experiences. But before we can really do that effectively, I think we need accurate ideas about what these experiences are and about what sort of help is really needed. Uh, and a basic idea in our culture is that psychosis is just something that's entirely bad. And from that follows the idea that help would mean just trying to get rid of the experiences. Um, but, th but there are different ideas about what psychosis might be. Like the idea that psychosis, we've heard people talk about it, that it might be part of an effort at adaptation. It might be people trying to figure out how to solve some kind of problem. And so in that case, suppressing psychosis might even be harmful if we just try to suppress it. Or there's the idea that we're all psychotic at some level, maybe even at the deepest level. And you know that the deepest level of our psyche is just this churning something. And, 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 and so then if we get rid of psychosis in somebody, we've essentially eliminated the person if we totally got rid of it. Um, so, so anyway, if psychosis is more complex than just something going wrong, then it makes sense that we need a more nuanced approach to helping than, than what's common in our culture. And we need to make sure that when we're helping people, we're not um, going too far and actually interfering with vital parts of their functioning. So that's what I want to talk about today. By the way, is the sound OK? Is it too loud, too quiet? It's OK? OK. So one idea about psychosis or madness is that the, I, that, that the concept of it is always going to be uh, what's been called essentially contested. That means we can really never expect to have agreement on it. Uh, there's certain kind of concepts that, have, that some people have agreed that are always going to be essentially contested, like the nature of what's beautiful. People are always going to argue about that, right? So maybe the meaning of madness is the same thing. And that's what was, there, there's a ISPS book uh, called um, Making Sense of Madness, Contesting the Meaning of, of Schizophrenia by John Reed and Jim Geeky. So if we accept that, that maybe that's possible, then we, we might quit expecting to see agreement about exactly what madness is. And instead, kind of this idea that, that maybe we're always gonna have contrary ideas about it going around. But I think it's not just that the meaning of psychosis is essentially contested, but actually I think within psychosis itself, there's contesting meanings plays a key role. Um, especially people are questioning meanings that, that usually are taken for granted. And a lot of people, I've, I've heard this actually quite a few times, that people have become recognized that they, they kind of like transitioned into psychosis when they started questioning too many things at once and, and really experimenting with alternative meanings, looking at things really different ways. So um, this idea of a breakdown in meaning and then having to put meaning back together uh, is an essential part of what I use kind of as my rough map of psychosis, which is on this slide. Um, and that basically, you know, when we're running into some kind of problems and it just isn't working for us, our ways of thinking about things break down. Or in this slide, it's talking about our construct system breaks down. We just, we just start questioning a lot of things. It's just not working. And we end up temporarily in this space where it's called a temporary suspension of constructs or encou encounter with it's been called the transliminal, the state where we just don't know what's going on because we've given up our usual way of looking at things and we don't really have a way. So we're just like, where are we? Um, in, in, in the Middle Ages, somebody wrote a book called The Cloud of Unknowing, which I read that when I was going through experiences like that and thought it captured quite a bit of it. But then somehow we have to 
Um, we have to put our, our ideas back together again. And by the way, this can be very scary if we're feeling threatened while we're in that state. It can be very scary. If we're feeling calm and relaxed while in that state, it can be very mystical. It can be very, um, very just like an encounter with mystery. But when we're feeling scared, um, you know, because there's a sense, if you don't know who you are or where you are, then any malevolent entity could be close by. Any, anybody might be open. You, you, you have no sense of boundaries, no sense of protection. It can be very scary. And so people often will have to put their world back together, but, but when people are scared and, and they're stressed in other ways, the way they put their world back together might not work very well. And then they end up just back in a, in a system where it breaks down, and then they end up back and confused again. And, and, and the people can get kind of like stuck in a loop there. But the, the thing is, and, and, and that can last for a whole lifetime. It can, and so psychosis can be a very terrible thing when people are just kind of like caught in a vicious circle where they're getting more confused and, and more scared. It can be kind of a terrible thing. But, the same process can lead to really positive outcomes, especially if people get the support they need to work through it um, in, a, in a safe way. And that, of course, is what we're really trying to do here in ISPS. People can come up with new visions, um, new ways of looking at themselves in the, in the world. This can be a process that ends up feeling very spiritual. Um, so, um, somebody quoted here um, the saying that uh, the mystic is often um, swimming in the same ocean in which the psychotic is floundering, um, or sometimes. It, 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 but 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 basically, that's this the state of when people are um, just really open. Um, to looking at things different ways, if you can become comfortable with that. And so part of it is understanding that people with psychosis can be helped to do that, to be, become more comfortable with uncertainty, but I think they're really only helped to do that when we ourselves can be more comfortable with uncertainty. And somebody commented here how they really were feeling a lot of people talking from that perspective, that, oh yeah, People are willing to be uncertain and, and just exploring what's going on with people rather than thinking they know it all. Um, but before we want to, I, I talk more about breakdowns in meaning. I just want to reflect on the question, what, what, what does meaning mean? <laughs> Might seem I'm questioning too much, but, um, but for example, if, I, if, if you hear somebody start yelling fire right now, um, and you thought they meant the building was on fire, you'd probably all want to get up and run out to save yourselves, right? But if you thought they were yelling fire because they were talking about getting fired up about something exciting, then you might get into it with them and maybe you'd yell fire too and jump around or something like that. It could have very different meaning, but the meaning really relates to how it makes us move. Well, you can really tell what something means by, by how it makes you move. So meaning and, and motion are very connected. I like in um, NLP, they used to say the meaning of your communication is the response that you get. So what, what, you, um, what, what, what you say means, what it, you can find out what it means to someone else by seeing how they respond to it. Now, it might mean something different to you, but you can see what it means to them by how they respond. But meaning is tricky because um, it can mean different things. It's the same thing can mean different things to different people. And it's, you know, usually in everyday life, there's lots of confusion about what means what and what situation. But it's when kind of like a whole system of meaning starts to be called into question at once that we start thinking of people as maybe they're, they're losing their mind. Um, they've really lost at least a big chunk of their system of meaning. Or maybe they're grabbing on. See, see, there's both a dual, there's a dual nature of psychosis. There's both people losing their sense of meaning and so there's this state of unknowing and confusion. And then there's people grasping on to um, meanings to try to save themselves from that ocean. You know how drowning people grab onto things to save themselves? Well, people often grab on to really fixed meanings without being able to question their meaning at all. 
and that's also part of psychosis. Um, but if we understand that, I think we can um, start um, being, being better at helping people. So another thing, as I said, what is meaning? The other question I, I want to ask, what is mind? Um, and Dan Siegel, who some of you might know, um, he likes to make fun of the way we have this really large field of mental health in our culture, but often when he asks people to define mind, they, do a very, they don't have very good ideas about it. So he's put a lot of thought into it, and what he's come up with is this, this definition that mind is an embodied and relational, emergent, self-organizing process that regulates the flow of energy and information both within us and between and among us. Now, he can talk for an hour on that, and I'm sure we could talk for a long time just on what, to, just to unpack that definition. Um, but there's a whole lot of things you could say about it. Because it's a process, um, and it involves both bodies and it involves relations, it, it involves stuff that happens not just inside bodies. Mind is not just limited to inside our brain or inside our body. It involves our, our brain and body, but it's not just limited to that. That's one key thing to know. But the other key thing to draw from that, I think, for this purpose of this talk, is that it's really mind that regulates meaning, because that flow of energy is all about meaning. Remember, meaning's connected to how we move. Um, so, so mind is, is regulating um, how, what kind of meaning we come up with. And it's basically trying to, we have different kinds of meaning that we have to integrate. So, so re, you can't really regulate something without integration. And, and Dan talks about that, he talks about that as involving the linkage of differentiated parts. So to have mind, we have to have both, be, we have to be able to make connections between things, and we also have to create boundaries be, between things. And of course, that's contradictory, but you really need both in order to have mental functioning. Um, now, what happens when you don't have integration is you end up with either um, a state of something kind of chaotic or, or rigid. And um, I was sort of talking about that, when you're either lost and confused or you're really fixated on one particular kind of thing. Um, Dan would like to, Dan in his talks points out that pretty much all the DSM disorders involve some variation on chaos and rigidity. So really they can be seen as problems in integration, which is we all have problems in integration. Like I was saying at the beginning of this conference, how are you guys gonna integrate everything you've heard here? It's difficult, right? <laughs> It's difficult to make sense of it. Um, and it's especially tricky because we can't really totally say that either chaos or rigidity are always a bad thing. Um, you know, because for, if things are unnecessarily rigid, then creating some chaos and shaking them up is often a good thing. And similarly, if things are too chaotic, that sometimes coming in and um, being really you know, rigid and, and trying to set some, set some order can actually be a, a, a good thing. One thing you see that, because you see these processes happening not just within people, but you see it in bigger systems, like you see it in nations. For example, in a given nation at a certain point, some people might see the problem as that the existing order needs to be disrupted, right? That that might be what they really focus on and think's important, and maybe they're right. Or maybe some people will see that the disruption as the problem and they'll want to do something like impose martial law, a really rigid kind of order to get things back under control. So I'm trying to um, help us grapple with this sense of the duality of, of losing our mind because there's, there's really these two sides to it. Um, when we lose our patterns of meaning, that's when we kind of like lose our mind. And, and things can get, all get really chaotic. But another way of losing our mind is if we actually get too close-minded, we can kind of lose our mind. Um, because when we're really rigid about things, we're really not open to thinking. And so we're just kind of like stuck in one pattern. And that's not really mental functioning either. Um, but even something like losing our mind, is that always a bad thing? Um, Alan Watts used to say that 
we have to get out of our mind to get back to our senses. Uh, and so one reason we'd want to get out of our mind is just to um, quit evaluating and thinking about things and, and, and just get into the raw information that's, that's coming into our senses. Um, and spiritual people like to point out that we often um, tend, to, tend to identify with our minds and we don't notice what, what goes beyond them. So we, we all make important discoveries when we go outside of our usual minds. You know, there's our, our, the usual way our mind's functioning. And so we can have, um, and, and, and what we come up with when we get outside of our usual mind can be a variety of, of different um, kinds of things. Some things might just be of personal significance. So um, I, I, Dina Tyler, I don't believe is here in this room, but she's been at this conference. But she's told her story uh, where she once, you know, like went days without sleep and got kind of manic, and then she started having revelatory experiences and discovered the meaning of life and started calling all her friends, only instead they came and shipped her off to the mental ward. And at the mental ward, she told everyone what they discovered, what she discovered, and they just told her she was crazy. And later, um, she was thinking about it, and she said, you know what, and she learned more about psychology, and she learned that, well, the meaning of life I discovered is pretty much what Maslow wrote about in his hierarchy of needs. And then what she started wondering is, like, well, why, when I told all these people in the hospital who supposedly were trained in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, why did the, none of them just tell me, hey, you know, listen, girl, you know, p other people have discovered that already. You know, you just need to chill, and it's important stuff, but you just need to chill and get some sleep. You know, that would have been so much more meaningful than telling her she was crazy. They could have told her, hey, it's good ideas, but you got to settle down and sleep a little, and somebody else already discovered this. Um, so sometimes people discover important stuff in a psychotic episode, but it's it's just personally new. It may not be culturally new. But other times it really can be cultural significance. You know, when we think of people who are the prophets or, or even somebody like Marsha Linehan. I mean, she, she was, um, it's common knowledge now that when she was younger, she'd been diagnosed with, psych with, a, with psychosis. And then she actually had a vision in a church after that when she was out of the hospital where everything started shimmering and some kind of presence came towards her. And when it... Um, reached her, she was overcome with experience of complete acceptance of everything around her, and that formed the basics of her notion of radical acceptance, which has now become part of our culture and DBT. Not that it's completely new to all cultures, but it was kind of a new thing that she brought into our culture. Um, so that's Im so important things can come in um, when people are in altered states. Um, and also just generally the ability to relate to the transcendental itself, the ability to hang out with mystery, to hang out in that state where we don't know um, is, is something people get experience of when they go outside their minds. And again, we can go outside our minds in little ways or in big ways. Um, but I want to I want to talk more about how culture and all and subcultures and all that fits into this. But before I do, I want to make sure you all know what the definition of fractal means. And so it's loosely defined as structures such as eroded coastlines or snowflakes in which similar patterns recur at progressively smaller scales. So like here you have this, you know, um, you have land sticking out, but then water. Um, a pattern of, of, of bays and inlets, and they, they um, exist on smaller and smaller scales as it goes in. Um, so I think that this sort of thing applies to mind and to, um, and to culture as well, because um, in cultures make meaning, right? So in cultures are in a sense like a kind of group mind. Um, and at the same time, that meaning is always being contested. So there's both meaning making, and then there's the contesting of meaning, questioning of meaning, bringing in contradictory meanings. Um, and that same thing happens you know, at the level of cultures interacting with each other. It happens at the level of subcultures um, interacting with the primary culture or families interacting within all that. Between families and individuals, we have the family meaning, and then the individual might have a contrary meaning, question the family meaning. Um, and then even within individuals, we have the 
um, the conscious part of the self, and we have, uh, we have uh, you know, the parts or voices within the person. Um, we all have parts or voices within us, even if we don't hear voices in the hallucinatory sense. So to form our identity and, and our own path, we both need our ability to come up with meanings and to contest meanings. It's, a two -way, it's always a two-way street. Um, and we can resist what the culture teaches us in, in meanings and assert our meanings against it. Uh, and another thing that happens is, um, you know, I talked about how mind is embodied. Um, but often there's things in our bodies that um, can put us at odds with the culture. For example, at one point, um, being left-handed was not acceptable. But if your brain had biologically organized in a left-handed kind of way, you were kind of like stuck. You either had to try to pretend to be right-handed or, or be left-handed and get in trouble. Obviously, people, you know, sexual orientation is something, wherever it comes from, it becomes very much internal part of people, but then the culture has to wrestle with that. Does the culture open up to allow for people to have those kind of meanings, or does it try to suppress that? Um, and so all that kind of stuff really, really is part of what affects people. We have intersections. Um, we have intersections between the, the relationships people have, which then affects them, and people internalize a lot about relationships. Um, a lot of the way that our, you know, that w how our, you know, what happens in our brain is a result of the relationships we have. And then, of course, who we are and who we feel we are inside is going to affect, go back the other way. Um, so there's all these intersections, but then there's all these complex kinds of relationships we have and, and different kinds of meaning. And so for young people, they have to figure out, what the heck does all this mean? How to, how to resolve all these competing claims for, um, for who you are and for which direction to go in? Um, and so I want to talk a little about how this came for me personally, how this came down for me, um, and some of the things. Because I had, um, some of you already know that I'm someone who had, uh, like, period of a few years over which I could often have been diagnosed with psychosis probably, but I managed to stay outside the system. I was never got totally lost control of my life. Um, but the things that had affected me were some of the contradictions that I'd, I'd run into. Like one of it was I was from a, a poor blue collar family background, you know, no, um, nobody had any advanced education. Um, and we were poor, big family. Um, I was, had experienced a lot of abuse and bullying. Um, but then I, you know, as I started going into college, I realized, hey, I actually had a pretty sharp mind and I could succeed academically and really be at the top of my class. And also, of course, had the white male privilege, which was just kind of like I was used to being the underdog, right? And all of a sudden, I'm. Um, uh, but then at the same time, the hippies were, you know, really strong in my hometown with their, you know, and I was reading about, you know, some mystical literature and psychedelic, taking psychedelics. And um, another thing was the culture that I was around was very heterosexist and homophobic. And yet my own feelings from my body were mostly gay sexual feelings and attractions. Um, I was, I, I was an, definitely an ex-Catholic at that time, but I still had strong values about um, social justice that came out actually out of a the more liberal Catholic tradition and, and caring for the underdog. And at the same time, I had a sense, well, it doesn't make sense to care about anything. I was drawing from traditions like Dada art tradition and, and or absurdist um, art that where it doesn't, nothing really matters. And, how does that all make one picture? How do you fit that together? <laughs> you know, you got all these different things coming at you. Um, and yeah, so, somehow, and, and so a lot of my answer was, well, it's just all nonsense. It doesn't make one picture. It's all ridiculous. Um, but it's all absurd and meaningless. But of course, if everything's meaningless, how can that really guide you? 
Um, well, one answer I came up with, and I actually had a friend who was on, kind of on the same wavelength with me here, when, was since we could see the absurdity at all, of all of it and other people couldn't, we were better than everyone else. So it was kind of a grandiose kind of or meaning making. Um, but of course, there was that subtle question that could have undermined that, which, if everything is absurd, why does it even matter if we notice that it's absurd or not? <laughs> oh, well. Uh, but, um, but then there was also kind of like a, a sense that came into it, well, maybe the meaning of everything was that I could make anything mean whatever I want it to mean. You know, I could be like God and just create meaning and, and make, um, he actually, you know, at some points I was actually thinking I could just recreate the universe however I wanted it to be. Um, but, um, you know, it would take a long time to get into everything that I was thinking back then, but anyway, this basic idea of all these things, all these possible meanings. Um, so, but one of the things was, was I, in some sense I was trying to make sense of it all, there was another sense in which I was trying, deliberately trying to leave certain things out of the picture that I made. Um, and a key thing that I was trying to leave out was anything that had to do with the abuse or how I felt about that. Because that was the stuff that was overwhelming, traumatizing, made me feel bad. And so that's also, because I was trying to leave that out, that's why I was often going towards the more grandiose kind of stuff, you know, because I was trying to compensate for, I mean, I might have consciously been pushing the abuse away. My, the way I, one way I pushed it away is I just told myself, I am not the person who lived my first 16 years. I, I, I decided I am just not that person. That's not me. I came into being um, during an LSD trip when I was in high school. <laughs> that was, and I actually really identified that way, I'd say pretty much for 10 years, uh, that, that I was really not the person that I'd grown up as. And it wasn't until, sorry, it still chokes me up. <laughs> um, until one of my brothers committed suicide. And he had never complained about anything growing up, but I knew he'd been treated the same way I was. Then I realized I had to deal with my trauma stuff. <laughs> but anyway, I'd pushed that away. So that was definitely, it was pushing, pushing things away, pushing some kind of meanings away, um, really distorts that whole effort to try to make sense of everything. And it can really create a lot of chaos and confusion. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it's the, you know, the, the whatever dominant meaning we're making, it's, it's busy trying to push certain kind of meanings away, but because those meanings are not being included, the dominant meaning feels hollow or, or not, not right, not authentic. And so it's, there's something in us always trying to undermine that dominant meaning we have because there's a sense that it's not authentic. Um, so um, all that kind of like creates an opening for chaos, as the slide says. Uh, but fortunately, in my own stormy search for what would work, I was able to make enough sense to go on with my life. And I think it especially helped that I found others who were also struggle, struggling with the absurdity and contradictions of, of modern existence. Uh, we found some ways to connect with each other and kind of like get away with making up our own meanings. Um, and, and I like that expression that art is what you can get away with. Um, because, but, but it was interesting, even though we were making up our own meanings, we had to coordinate to do stuff with each other. One group I became part of was this thing called the Suicide Club. Um, it was sort of like urban adventures, like one of the first adventures, like let's dress as pirates and then we'll get in boats and we'll go board this replica of the Golden Hind that was in the harbor and we'll celebrate the Queen's birthday with a Pollock. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. The night watchman caught us, but the police were not mad at us once we started singing them pirate songs and offering them food. <laughs> so anyway, but there's a whole history of this because my friend John Law, um, who by the way, he came out to San Francisco after just getting out of the psych ward himself. Um, he went on to help form the Cacophony Society that then took Burning Man to Nevada, and there's a whole long history of that. Um, and 
it's just kind of like goes to show how that this ferment of people kind of like making up their own meanings and questioning established meanings and, and being kind of like wild um, can lead to cultural change. Now, whether you think Burning Man is a good cultural change or not is up for question. And actually, John himself quit participating once it got big enough it needed to have rules. Um, and the last year there, he was there, he kind of undermined it by taking the neon and making it so that every once in a while, if you looked at a little smiley face, would go on the, the man that they burn. I don't know if you know about it, but anyway. But, but anyway, I, I, I think that this sense that, you know, that when people really question established meanings, that creates these openings for something else to come in. We talked about it yesterday in terms of the beyond. But, and, and it's not necessarily always something spiritual. It might come across more as just cultural or just a different way of doing things. Um, but that's something that can come out of this process of questioning meaning. That, that's something that can. Um, but let's step back, though, and look now at what's the relationship between most of the mental health system and this process of questioning meaning. Um, well, really, um, a lot of what the mental health system does is, is kind of like basically impose its meaning on people, um, and it, it, it expects people to adjust to the dominant meanings. And, and so in, in that sense, it could, some people call that kind of colonizing. Um, it basically... Um, the mental health professionals often see that that's their job, where to help people adjust. If someone is different or bizarre, um, then the purpose is to let's make them more normal. Let's, you know, um, you're allowed to be different as long as that, that doesn't cause too much friction with the established order. But if it does, um, then, well, what needs to happen is, is just getting the person back to normal. Um, and often it's not obvious that we're kind of like suppressing someone's own meaning because often pe we get people to agree that they themselves want to suppress the divergent meaning that they might be feeling. Um, and it's sort of like where, um, you know, I, I, it says in the slide, they become agents in their own colonization. You know, what's different about me is my mental illness. I need to get rid of it. And, and people, we help people get organized that way. Um, rather than possibly as seeing, hey, you know, I guess I'm not sure I want to fit in. Maybe there's something in me that, you know, one, one thing I was able to stay identified with the forces within me that wanted to question things. But I think if I'd been dragged into the mental health system and let's say I decided I've got to become sane now, I might have really gone to war with those parts of me that were di trying to be different. But that didn't really happen with me, but I think that is often what happens. And then what happens is that psychiatric drugs really tend to promote that whole process too. If you um, read the literature on people that have tried antipsychotic drugs who weren't psychotic at all, people like Richard Bentall, who's a, a psychologist who's written a lot of books, just talks about taking those drugs and just feeling totally a loss of initiative or his own will or his own ability to really think, you know, um, think very, any, of anything very original and just would find himself just going along with whatever other people suggested. Um, now that kind of stuff might help if somebody is really having extreme problems and fitting in and they just need to dampen that down some so that they can get out of some kind of chaotic situation. But it's really not a very good long-term solution. Um, and it definitely, I think, can prevent those kind of problems um, the, the kind of problems with dissociation and the kind of problems with trauma that hasn't been worked through and all that, it can prevent it, I think, from getting resolved if we rely on that kind of stuff. So I think this exclusive adjustment on, this, this exclusive focus on adjustment is really risky. And it's, it's risky not just for individuals, but it's risky for our culture. Um, because ex excess conformity is kind of like monoculture. Um, it reduces the culture's capacity to handle altered situations, 
um, the kind of situations where you really do need new visions and new ways of doing things. Um, it, it basically suppresses some of the wild experimentation. Um, Sandra Bloom has this phrase, she calls it risky risk avoidance. So it's, it's risky to let you know, young people experiment with, with, with altered states, but it's also um, risky not to. And we need more people, as Martin Luther King said, to become creatively maladjusted to what's wrong in the culture. Um, and we also, um, now a lot of people, of course, what happens in psychosis is not creative maladjustment at that point, it's just maladjustment, but sometimes it's people trying to find what would be a creative maladjustment. They're struggling to find that. Um, just like, you know, um, well, that's, I won't go into that. But another thing that's important is that when, when that there's too much emphasis on conformity, that people can end up damaging themselves trying to too much to conform. You know, for example, somebody maybe who hears voices and has for their whole life, and yet they get in the mental health system and hear that being healthy is to not hear voices. Well, um, or Eleanor Longden was an example of that. She heard just one voice that wasn't causing her too much trouble, and then she got dragged into the system. They told her the voice meant she had schizophrenia. She tried to get rid of it. Within a few months, she had 12 very nasty voices because they didn't react very well to a attempting to get suppressed. And then being caught up in that whole internal warfare is really damaging not just to the individual, but, but also to society that loses then the, the talents of that person that's caught up in that kind of struggle. So instead, what makes sense, I think, is what's called the emancipatory approach, which is where we really work on changing society to increase the acceptance of people that are different and also help people change so that they can accept differences in themselves um, and find a way to work with those differences, like, like voices or... Um, and when we have divergent meanings, and this is true at a lot of levels, and it's, this is true um, within individuals, this is true within individuals um, and families, and also with wider culture, we, we want to create a shift from conflict to dialogue and mutual respect and, and kind of taking turns. So if any kind of suppression has to happen, it, it, it is not... Um, it's more like this, in, in a dialogue, you know, one person has to be quiet so the other person can talk, but it's a temporary suppression. And that's really what you see, um, you know, like in working with voices or, or um, that if people will say, you know, or to, to the voices, well, I can't talk to you now, but I'll, I'll listen to you what you have to say at three or something like that. There's, there's kind of like an openness to hearing, but, but also sometimes there's, being able to push something away, but then later come back to it. Uh, and one thing that's kind of tricky, well, how do you have emancipation for really opposite meanings when, when, when there's, uh, you know, some of the real contradictions that we run into? Um, and I, so I like this quote from, from, um, the Principia Discordia. The Discordians are kind of like a, a humorous religious group, but they really have some interesting insights. So they say all statements are true in some sense, false in some sense, and meaningless in some sense. Uh, so one thing is, is like anything that somebody says, probably if you, if you look at it hard enough, you'll find some way in which it's true. Some, some level of truth, or it's true if you look at it a certain way, or maybe it's true in some kind of metaphorical way. So being able to, 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 to both look for truth in certain kind of expressions while also being able to accept that, well, in another sense it may be false, in another sense it may not even really mean anything, um, that really allows an openness for looking at things really a lot of different ways. I've, one pattern I've noticed is that a lot of the people that seem to be best at therapy with psychosis have a, a background in literature. And a lot of it, I think, is because in literature, people are familiar with looking at all different kinds of meanings and looking at things in a different sense and that kind of thing. And it's really an important part 
and understanding people and finding meaning in what they say, while also being open to questioning their meaning. Well, is there a sense in which maybe what you're saying isn't true? Um, and, and the more we can do that and model doing that, the more it can feel acceptable to someone else to do that. Like, oh yeah, they're just treating me like another person. We all have only pieces of the truth. Um, so I want to just really quickly introduce you to this thing called a polarity map. But one meaning we think we, that pretty solid we have in our culture, it's good to feel good and it's not so good to not feel good. So we think that being happy and seeing the positive side of things is what psychology is supposed to be about, right? And it is enjoyable to look at things positively. Way, positively. It builds enthusiasm. You know, you can get into what you're doing and get some momentum around it if you're feeling good about it. But what's the downside to feeling good about things? Well, there is a downside. Um, when we're feeling good about what we're doing, we can get carried away with it. We can not notice problems with what we're doing. We might keep going with something even though it's starting to turn bad, you know? Our relationship is turning bad, but we keep going with it because we're just so sure it's the right thing and it's gonna work out. But that can, that can sometimes get us into such problems we might turn and go the other way. Maybe there is some value in seeing the dark side. So some of the value in seeing the dark side is that then we can slow down, we can actually notice the problems in our life, we're no longer doing all that positive thinking and then maybe we can change directions and correct mistakes. Yeah, maybe I need to date somebody else or whatever it is, we can change. Um, but there's a dark side to noticing the dark side. If we're always just looking at what's wrong with things, you know, it, for one thing, it feels bad to look at problems with things. And we may miss opportunities because we're always being too cynical. Um, and we lose momentum because you can't get very enthusiastic about things when you're doing the dark side, looking at the dark side. So then, well, maybe shift back towards looking at the, the positive side. Now, this, this thing called a polarity map, it's something that was developed for addressing questions that really don't have any fixed answer. Um, but really, a lot of the stuff in psychology doesn't, and, and the way our minds work, doesn't have a fixed answer. And um, so this allows us to integrate um, opposite meanings, and we look at, can look at any, and, and try to integrate them and not stay stuck on one particular kind of meaning. And I think when, if we can do that, we can be less full of ourselves when we're treating people and, and more open to different kinds of, um, you know, that something might have, a lot, of, a lot of things are positive up to a point, but if you take them too far, they become negative. In CBT, we call that overdeveloped coping strategies when you do something too much and underdeveloped when you don't do it enough. Um, but really, looking at the positive side as a coping strategy up to a point, if you do it too much, it's bad. Looking at the dark side is a coping strategy up to a point. Um, I had another slide, I'm gonna get into this one, but um, I just wanted to say in general, um, what's really important is to have curiosity um, you know, people in a sense, each person, and especially when people are going through psychosis, they're in a sense, they um, are tr in this process of trying to reinvent themselves, and so they're often coming up with stuff that's really unique, so they're like a culture of their own. And what do you do when you go to a foreign culture? Well, um, Dan Danielle Knafo did a webinar with us, and one of the things she said, she said, one thing you don't do is you don't go in and say, where's the McDonald's? <laughs> you, you don't go in and look, expect everything to be totally normal. Instead, you try to figure out, oh, this is different. Let me understand how this works and how are things done here and, and that kind of thing. And so, and, and so it's that curiosity. And then even when there are pro problems, look for problem, look for solutions that might happen inside the culture. And then only if they're having problems with that, maybe consider introducing, well, have you ever tried this or that? More like stuff that, that you might know about. And only offer it in a tentative way. Don't be sure that your solutions are gonna be solutions for the person. Um, basically, you know, we're exploring this mystery of how do we exist together. Um, and, you know, sometimes people maybe aren't going to need a change. They can just go forward without changing. Um, 
they are just different. They believe in, you know, actually a lot of the research on the normal population says that, you know, maybe at least half the people in some studies have at least one belief that psychiatrists think are delusion. Um, so often people can just go on. Or Paris Williams, some of you know him. Maybe you've heard the story about how his mother believed for all of her life, really, that when she was seven, a being from Venus came and inhabited her. And so she's really from Venus. And she actually has followers that, that follow her because they think she has wise advice from Venus. And she's never been in the mental health system. You know, so, hey, it's just curious. Some, some people can get by with pretty strange, different cultures um, within our culture. Um, but then it's also a collaborative process of discovery, like when there are problems, looking at how we can work those problems out, um, how the person can work how the person can make peace with the different parts of themselves, of their own internal culture, how they, you know, they can make peace with their families, and, and, and f how people can find a subculture that, that works for them. Because sometimes, you know, if people can find a subculture, like I talked about finding a subculture with the San Francisco Suicide Club that really, okay, I could really click there and, 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 and make sense, and then only eventually reach out to the broader culture. Um, so, and this is a living process. It doesn't have any fixed resolution. Um, you know, that, um, and I say in, in both sanity and insanity have their place. But actually, we're, always, we're always, always trying to figure out what sanity is. And just like madness is a contested concept, well, so is sanity a contested concept. You know, like what we think of as sane, you know, David Oakes would say, well, normal people are destroying the planet. Is that sanity? Um, I think maybe just one more. Um, no, that's, that's the last one I'll, I'll do. Um, so yeah, so I think we can open up to questions or comments or something like that. Dr. Unger, first of all, I, this is some comments. Uh, first of all, I, my, I have a brother who took his own life, so I can feel with you. Um, and secondly, I just recently completed a two-day um, training in assist. Do you know what that is, right? Um, yeah. Applied suicide intervention skills training. And in Oregon, su suicide is no longer considered illegal. So they were saying to try to avoid using the word commit because to say commit is sorry, crimin criminalizing it. So just to bring this to your notice and in any future talks, you know, took his or her own life or people who take their own lives. But um, thanks once again. I, as I said earlier, I attended a couple seminars at PSU that you gave on mindfulness and I appreciate and really connect with, with your lectures. So thank you. Thank you. Ron, thank you so much. I'm very appreciative of um, um, the personal aspect of, of uh, what you had to say to us today and um, the whole um, array of associations that you were able to put out. Um, that I certainly resonated with in a lot of different ways. Uh, so thank you. Um, one thing that very much struck me was your, um, your use of the term colonization to talk about what the mental health system does to people. And it occurred to me that uh, this term colonization is also coined uh, it, it's, it's a term that was used, I think, by Benedetti, the, the founder of ISPS. Perhaps not. Uh, if Brian Kohler were here, he could tell us for sure. But I believe this was Benedetti's term, his way of describing um, sort of an overarching term for what he took to be a, a certain subjective experience in certain types of psychosis. A, vaguely malign 
feeling of presence that is in me but not of me. Uh, that was his term for it. One could say infiltration or permeability, mm -hmm. but it's a sneaky, has a grimy sense of presence, you know, within oneself mm -hmm. uh, that is not really supposed to be there. And I think to sort of um, explore that a little more, you know, um, it, it also reminds me that in, in my experience in, in the state hospital, I see how often um, some of the more problematic aspects of psychosis are replicated or mirrored or enhanced in the structures of the way the place is set up. So there's a certain parallel there between that, that uh, colonized intrapsychic experience and the surrounding social structure that ends up kind of, uh, well, you know, I have a new term for what that is. I would say parallel, but I think we could call that a fractal now in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, that was an association I had to your, to your talk, um, but, but thank you. Yeah, I, I think that some of the things people sense and, and, and talk about in language that sounds psychotic can be that sense of being colonized and sometimes even kind of like benevolent or people that are trying to be benevolent can have that effect on, on someone. I'm thinking of a client I had who started talking about his concern that I was installing machines in him. And we kind of like figured out that what he, I was proposing ideas, but he felt like probably because he didn't have the ability to, to critique my ideas, he felt like they were just coming in and, and they were being installed in him, and he didn't like that. Um, but it was good to be able to grasp, well, maybe that's what he meant. And I needed to soften my approach and realize I need to be really, because again, remember I said the meaning of your communication is the response that you get. I thought I was just gently throwing out suggestions, but his response was that those were coming in and he felt defenseless against them. So I had to be aware that, oh, that's the way it's coming across. I need to watch how I communicate. Somebody over here. Um, so I appreciate you bringing up this idea of colonization in psychology. And I'm wondering if we think about colonization in kind of like the literal sense of certain groups having been historically and contemporarily colonized. And so if a mental health provider can be a source of colonization, what does that mean for somebody who is um, part of an underserved um, or disenfranchised group who, was, who did experience colonization, literally? Um, and especially if the person is working with a therapist who um, identifies with the majority. Yeah. Um, I, I think that being, being aware of that is one of the um, important parts of that and, and getting to where that can even be part of the conversation that there are these pressures and trying, first of all, I think the therapist has to try to not be, become part of that. Um, then I, I think if, if you could get to where you could talk about it. Um, I would say um, there's probably people that could talk about that better than I could, <laughs> but um, I this, we've had a lot, some good discussions here about historical trauma and um, often the way cultures have just been, you know, sometimes it's more like with the Native Americans, it's been more like genocide that what happened. Um, but then, of course, it was not a complete genocide because we still have Native Americans around. And then um, the way those, um, definitely being sensitive to the fact that there, there may be a whole lot of ways. I mean, one thing we know about working with cross-cultural stuff is that there may be other ways of doing things that are very different than ours. And in some sense, they may be disruptive, but maybe they're only disruptive because we haven't made the right space for them. And if you make the right space for them, they're no longer disruptive. So, so sometimes that can be, be true of stuff that, that's coming up from a culture that's been suppressed, like let's say the Native American culture. Um, but sometimes also in psychosis, people are 
inventing their own or they're coming up with their own meanings that really could work um, if they were given the right kind of space or if the person learned to make the right kind of space for themselves. I think it's interesting that you took the word colonization and considered it literally and you went in a completely different direction than I did. I And kudos to you for using such non-traditional language which is spurring all this. Um, I started thinking about colonization in a, an infectious disease sort of way. Um, we are encouraged to use probiotics and too much of any one organism is seen as a bad thing and so I'm wondering if if part of a mistake that could be being made by some mental health providers is they're offering what for them was a, oh, this broke up my problem and wasn't a colonization or wasn't patho pathological to me, but maybe to the person they're offering it to, it is harmful, it is oppressive. And I've found, at least in my own practice, the one thing to keep in mind is to have a diversity of, well, we could try this, we could try this, we could try this, or if you want to, you know, pick as many as you feel drawn to. In the same way that sometimes if you are colonized literally by a, an infection, there's more than one way to treat it, and, and really what you're doing kind of parallels to what you were saying is if things are too fixed, they need to be broken up a little bit but that process needs to be gentle. Yeah, it can, it can be complex what's needed and a lot of what you said talked about how we need to have choice and then respect people and in, in making choices and working it out rather than being too sure there's a one size fits all that we're gonna come in with. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed your lecture and it brought up for me um, a thought that I've held for a long time about this whole question of madness, where what I've seen is that there is a, a set of norms or what's considered normal or the culture. Um, it's like a convention that most people have agreed you know, they were like inducted into it from birth and then they followed the, you know, the whole pattern of thinking and accepting and rejecting. And so these people that they're now saying are mad are people who actually have seen the hollowness of this normalcy and they're saying, I'm not going for that. And so they just stand out with their ideas, their behavior, their rebellious nature, their organizations, the whole thing is counterculture to what is considered as normal. And f often, these people are brilliant. They have brilliant ideas, they have high creativity, but all of that is just pushed aside under the umbrella idea that these people are, you know, like rejects in society. That has been how I went, I guess, I don't remember when it came to me, but I remember I used to pass what is considered a madhouse, you know, where they put away all these people. And as a child, you know, it's like on a main street and I, I guess maybe that's where the thought came from. Why are these people being put away? And seeing some of these people, you know, just walking around in the street. Um, they are in a different world. You know, for example, somebody that's wearing five coats in the summertime. And that person is looking at these people, why are you looking at me? You know, they're, they're jealous. I've got five coats and they don't have any. This is coming from a different place altogether. And my second comment is, when I looked at the title of your talk, I thought you were actually going to be talking about colonization and cultures in the sense that the society with its stance on what is normal, anything that is different, like people coming to this country from so many different countries, and normalcy may be different, often is, like the way you express pain or you don't speak about your pain or you don't share certain things with outside your family. 
these things are not often understood or respected in the whole medical industry, but especially in psychiatry. And then you come into a complete misunderstanding and the, the, uh, oper the, the possibility, and often it's very real, of offending that person. And then they close down. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, it, it, that's where the kind of fractal concept comes in, because definitely when you have, let's say, a population of immigrants, they often are met with lack of understanding, or you should just do it our way, when really they have a way that works. Um, there may be certain things they need to learn to adjust, but they cannot maybe really keep a lot of their things. In the same way, the people that come into our offices, they they have a culture, even if it's a culture that they just invented themselves, and some of the things they may need to change to get by, but other things they could keep if we just took the time to understand them and help them find a way to make space for um, for the way they, they, they are and the way they want to be in the world. Um, and I'm hoping that you guys can all go away and, and do that because I think we've kind of run out of time for, <laughs> for our questions. So I really appreciate your interaction and you being here.